Greetings, everybody. Uh, let's get started today to uh, for our Chip Intelligent Health Lab series. Uh, and this is the tale of two AIs from vision to market with David Ferrucci, the founding lead PI of IBM Watson and CEO currently at Elemental Cognition. I'm Ken Mandel. I direct the Computational Health Informatics Program here at Boston Children's Hospital. And we're a 28-year-old program in multidisciplinary uh, fields within biomedical informatics, uh, research, and education. We're at www.chip.org. And this event series features thought leaders across healthcare, informatics, IT, science, innovation, and more. If you want to tweet along, here's a few handles, Elemental Cognition, um, Dr. Ferrucci's uh, company, um, our lab, et cetera. So we're going to uh, give a quick introduction to Dr. Ferrucci, and then he will present. Feel free to put your questions in the Zoom Q&A box as we go. I'll look at the chat box also, but Q&A is where the questions are best sent, and then we'll, then we'll close remarks. I just want to point out um, that our talk uh, today by David Ferrucci is very well-timed. Um, uh, Steve Lohr of the New York Times um, had the good sense to put David uh, on the cover of the business section uh, just a week ago of the, uh, of the Times. Uh, so there's an article uh, you can read about him there uh, to learn more. Um, but he is um, an award-winning AI researcher who is very well known for starting and leading the IBM Watson team that beat um, uh, a storied Jeopardy player who had already won 74 games in a row. And uh, he, um, uh, oops, wrong. sorry, he, um, uh, he created this landmark event in AI that, you know, uh, made the uh, jump to uh, uh, widespread public awareness. It was very unique for an AI project. Um, the results were um, above and beyond what anyone expected. Um, he stuck around at IBM Watson for a while and moved on and since 2015 has been leading elemental cognition and he'll tell us more about that. And with that uh, brief intro, I'm gonna turn it over to David Ferrucci. Great. Um, uh, can you guys hear me? Yes. All right, and I think I'm gonna now share my screen. Is that gonna work? Yes. Okay. Okay. Let me just share my whole screen. All right, can you guys see that? Looks good. All right, great. So um, thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction. Yeah, I titled this talk, The Tale of Two AIs, because it talks about sort of my, you know, um, my journey from working on uh, IBM's Watson all the way to what I'm doing today, which is el you know, elemental cognition. And one of the things that I sort of want to, um, sort of leave you guys with is how AI has evolved over the last, uh, you know, more than 10 years. And, and in particular in the area of data science and natural language processing and natural language understanding and, and informatics and how, you know, my vision for an AI that it really acts as an interactive thought partner uh, has, has, has always been there, but the technology and the implementation has evolved dramatically because that that vision is actually such an incredibly ambitious, ambitious and interesting interesting vision. So going back to you know the, the Watson project, Watson began as as a research challenge in an area called open domain uh, factoid question answering, and the Jeopardy challenge was sort of this great opportunity for IBM because it had great mass appeal. Uh, you know Ken Jennings was had was having his winning streak of over uh, 74 games. Um, and this was in 2004. 
And IBM was looking for the next deep blue, you know, the next un unsolved, generally thought impossible problem at the time that IBM can, re can work on and make some notable progress on and, and bring some you know, brand attention to, to, to IBM, as well as potentially having massive you know, commercial potential. And Jeopardy looked like this really interesting problem to try to do. And um, it was shopped around at some time in IBM, 2004, 2005. I was uh, personally extremely busy on a project, a different uh, AI project. And, um, and generally, most of IBM thought this was impossible. I was leading a team in an area called, called open domain factoid question answering. And so when this challenge became proposed, I was excited about, about doing it but couldn't be responsive in the 2005 time. In 2006, I, at the end of 2006, I was the only one in the company who said, I think we can do this and, um, and I wanna take it on. And I had enough credibility at the time for people to take a shot on me. Um, so, uh, you know, it began so end of 2006, early 2007. Jeopardy was an interesting problem because obviously at the time it was considered well beyond the state of the art. Broad domain, you know, it asks about all sorts of topics. The idea of the AI challenge was that the machine would be completely self-contained, right? Not connected to the internet, sort of, sort of, you know, human versus machine. You know, what a human standing there, you know, powered by a glass of milk and tuna fish sandwich, you know, um, brain fits in the shoebox, and now you've got this machine. How big would the machine have to be? Uh, to really compete against a human? How much power would it need? How would it be constructed? And so forth and so on. So it was a, a fascinating sort of AI question. Um, Jeopardy was also challenging because of the uniquely phrased questions. What did the, you know, we'll see some examples of this, but what, what were they even asking? Um, and precise answer required, no more, no less. Couldn't deliver an entire document, couldn't deliver a hit list of documents and, said, and say the answer is somewhere inside there, really had to be the exact answer. And because you can lose points if you buzz in and answer the question incorrectly, not only look stupid for the brand, but you could lose points in the game, you have to produce an accurate confidence estimation, meaning you have to predict whether or not you can answer that question. You have to know what you knew and know what you didn't know. Um, so, and speed, decision to answer in less than a second and then produce a final answer in, in two to three seconds really to be, com really to be competitive. Um, Broad domain, you know, Jeopardy question would ask would ask about all sorts of things. And there was a very long tail distribution. So even if you focused on the types of things would ask about in the top, uh, the head of the curve there, the head of the histogram, you only cover about 3%. Um, and, you know, for each one of these things, thousands upon thousands of things could be asked about. So um, even going for the head of the tail barely made a dent. So this is what it meant to really build a system that was not content specific, but more, more general than that. 13% of the questions didn't even indicate what they were asking for, what type of thing they were asking for. So here's a question, you know, in cell division, mitosis splits the nucleus and cytokinesis splits this liquid cushioning the nucleus. And this audience, you probably all know the answer, cytoplasm. Um, and in fact, Watson got this right, a very high degree of confidence. And when you see, uh, an AI answer a question like this, you you imagine, well, gee, it really understands, you know, cellular biology and it, you know, it knows what internal structure is and um, and various activities and the metabolic pathways and the cell membranes and what it means to surround and fill and contain and cushion. And the reality is no, um, this is just not how it works. And what, one of the things that I sort of want to impress upon you is how this sort of technology worked to answer Jeopardy questions and really how language models today work. And they work based on looking at to statistical patterns and word usage, not really by developing a deep understanding of the content and being able to reason about it. So this is not how it worked. Here's another question. And this question sort of helps reveal the difference between deeply understanding something and building sort of a mental conceptual model versus using statistical language models. So the question is, um, Treasury Secretary Chase just submitted this to me for the uh, for the third time. Guess what, pal? This time I'm accepting it. 
And you're, you, you, know, you can read this question, you probably, you may or may not know the history. Many people who don't know the history actually can quickly get this question right. The answer is resignation. But for those of the pe people who don't, aren't really parsing this and understanding it deeply and mapping it back to their understanding of the history, what they're doing is they're looking in this and they're saying, well, what sort of word follows submitted? And what might follow submitted in the context of an official, like a treasury secretary. And very quickly, sort of your, your statistical language model says the most likely word to follow that would be the word resignation. I don't necessarily even understand what a resignation is, but I've read enough or seen enough language that that's the word that pops out. And just to kind of make this interesting and, and, and poignant is that we took this question to a sixth grade and gave it to them, and they used their statistical language model, and they, they did not know the history, and came up with a very different answer, and that was friend request. So you, what you see here is in their context, in their data, they, their statistical model would predict the next word after submitted would be friend request. And this is really the difference. This is how statistical language models, in effect, work. Um, the other thing that made Jeopardy especially hard was the, uh, the questions were phrased in many ways to be entertaining, and they were. I mean, Jeopardy won Emmys for their questions. But for an AI trying to figure out what you're even asking for, it's not so simple. So here's one ancient Roman stand-up comedy. I'll tell, I'll, tell, I'll tell you, it was so cold today. How cold was it? It was so cold, I wish, you were, I wish we were back in 64 when he was emperor. Hot times, if you know what I mean. And of course, this is... Uh, asking who was the emperor of Rome in 64, and it was uh, Nero. And here's another one. Political police blotter seems this perp was the first murderer in the Bible, and to top it all off, he iced his own brother. I mean, figuring out what a perp is and what ice may mean in this context often means one of the sources you have to use to resolve uh, you know, the replacement of words and the prediction of words would be the Urban Dictionary, and of course, that would lead you to creating a lot of vulgar answers as well. So there's always a challenge in what sources do you use to resolve the connections between words and make the right uh, make the right predict make the right predictions. This is, of course, K in the answer. Um, also, questions were asked that put together different pieces of knowledge that don't typically appear in text together. So when 60 Minutes premiered, this man was U.S. president. How do you answer that? Well, you have to kind of start decomposing questions. And, you know, and, and so you take, you figure out, well, when did 60 Minutes premiere? And then, you know, formulate a new question. Well, it was 1968. Who was president in 1968? Okay, now it was Lyndon B. Johnson. So this is sort of uniquely challenging. So if you imagine what you're doing, every question that comes in, you don't know if you're going to be able to answer it straight up, or maybe you have to break it down. You don't have a lot of time to decide. So you go in parallel paths all at the same time, trying to figure out how to answer these various questions. Here's another one, a long, tiresome speech delivered by a frothy pie topping. Here again, decomposition helps. We decompose it into a long, tiresome speech and a frothy pie topping. The category is edible rhyme time. So we start generating alternative answers. We are checking whether or not the answers rhyme, and we know that the modifier precedes the thing being modified, so Watson would formulate the answer meringue, harangue, and it famously got lots of questions like this right, which was very cool. Um, there's another uh, uh, type of question that's particularly challenging where there's a missing link. So here we have the question, on hearing uh, of the discovery of George Mallory's body, he told reporters he still thinks he was first. Uh, here, um, you kind of have to say, well, I don't really know how to, well, I don't even really know what question is exactly being asked. There's something missing. When is there something missing? When isn't there something missing? So you start taking different entities and you start branching out and, and exploring things. Um, here we have, you know, what kinds of things can you be first at? And you start exploring that. What sorts of things is George Mallory related to? You'll find Mount Everest. Mount Everest is in fact the missing link. And this is really, at, it, what's really being asked here is who was first at Mount Everest and it was Edmund uh, Hillary. So how good did you have to be at this task 
to really win um, at Jeopardy. So Jeopardy was classified by different research scientists as um, a very challenging open domain fa factoid question answering task, as some of those questions indicated. But when it got down to a hardcore metric, how good did you have to be? So this is a really interesting plot that we actually used in the lab, and this is a metric we use to understand and drive our performance. These dots you see are actual Jeopardy games. And what I'm plotting is the performance of the winner of those games. And on the x-axis, I'm plotting the number of questions that the winner got a chance to answer. In other words, the ones that they were most confident in to compete for the buzz, try to uh, press and, and win, uh, win the buzz and get the opportunity to answer. So the average um, winner would get about 45% of the board. And um, and would answer about you know 85 um, would answer with an accuracy the the y axis of about 85 percent uh, right of the ones they chose to answer. Ken Jennings was an extraordinary outlier. Ken Jennings um, would on average answer about 61 percent of the questions, and you know and and then of those get about 91 percent right. So it was an extraordinary Jeopardy player as people who follow Jeopardy certainly certainly know. And, um, and now if you took the state of the art open domain factoid question answering system and tried to run it on Jeopardy, you got this curve. This is what we call the confidence curve. And um, it's not very good. It's essentially saying the questions that it was most confident in, so it would rank the questions based on confidence, it only got about 47% you know, of those right. As it went down, in other words, it became less and less confident in its answer, it got less right, uh, all the way where it was answering 95% uh, in total only got 13% right. So not only is, um, is its overall accuracy bad, but the confidence score is not good. If you are computing your confidence well, oops, the, uh, excuse me, the curve would start high, you know, high, and then as you, your confidence went down, sorry, as your confidence went down, the curve would slope down, and then you'd start to get less right when you thought you were less confident in those questions. So this is a, not a good shape to the curve and, um, and clearly not good enough to win. To win, you'd have to cross, your curve would have to cross that winner's cloud at the top. So we built an architecture, um, and you know we published all this in, in, in a number of different journals and publications. And essentially we took a question in, we broke it up into multiple pieces. We did searches to find many, many possible uh, answers. We filtered those answers by a number of soft filtering algorithms. And then we created hundreds of features, features that looked at geospatial uh, terms and phrases that typed them or classified the terms and phrases, that looked for temporal terms and phrases, looked for how the question was composed, relational elements of the question, grammatical co-occurrence information, source information, even pun information. And each of these features were these sort of narrowly defined features that would look for these signals. None of them really deeply understood what was going on. Language understanding at a deep level is actually very hard but it would look at these superficial features, but with enough of them and with enough candidate answers, we'd be able to score those features and then learn how to combine those scores. And we learned how to combine those scores using machine learning. Machine learning was used to generate some of those scores, but then was also used to, to combine, weigh them all relative to one another using training data to say which one, which one of those possible candidates floats to the top. I may generate thousands of candidates for every question, score them, and then rank them based on those trained models. So that's how it worked. Watson ran on 2,880 cores, 15 terabytes of RAM, and never went to disk. Um, and, it, and with massive parallelization, uh, we were able to answer in uh, on average less than less than three seconds. Um, so going back to that question, in cell division, mitosis splits the nucleus and cytokinesis splits this liquid cushioning the nucleus. We would analyze that question, find the key terms, know we're looking for a liquid, find the key relationships that liquid exists in, like cushions and splits, not really knowing what they mean, but just knowing that you're going to go and look and try to match other words and predict other words that are in similar contexts. 
do searches, generate a long list of candidates. It's almost like turning the question into a big multiple choice question and then evaluating each choice. We generate all of these. We then, for each one of them, go and find other evidence that might support uh, that answer um, and then score that evidence. And these are all the feature generators that we engineer to score them. And there's well, many of them, up, up to 600 of them. And then we'd use our machine learning models to say which one floats to the top and earns the most confidence where that confidence was actually mapped to a probability. And so this is kind of how uh, Watson uh, worked. Along the, uh, along the road, well into the four year project, there was a lot to do. Just, you know, we had to refine that architecture. We had to build more and more features, do experiments, figure out if those features were working, not working. And we, you know, weren't perfect. And so this is, I'm just sharing with you some of the sort of Watson's great errors, right? So we would do error analysis on a regular basis to understand where it was failing. Decades before Lincoln, Daniel Webster spoke of government made for, made by, and answerable to them. Uh, the right answer is the people. Watson's answer at the time was no one. Uh, New York Times headlines, an exclamation point was warranted for the end of this in 1918. The right answer was World War I. Uh, an early version of Watson's answer was a sentence. So you could see how predicting words doesn't always work. Here's another one. In 1994, 25 years after this event, one participant said, for one crowning moment, we were creatures of the cosmic ocean. And the right answer was the Apollo 11 and Watson, the Big Bang. Not a lot of people around 25 years after the Big Bang uh, to comment on it. But, you know, Watson really didn't understand that. And then finally, just for fun, give a Brit a tinkle when you get into town and you've done this. The right answer, call on the phone. Watson's answer, urinate. So there was lots to do, even with a good design and a good approach that showed promise. There was a tremendous amount of refinement of these algorithms to ultimately get Watson to perform and win at the game. So over four years, 40 AI scientists, engineers broke new ground in AI, hundreds of NLP features. We, we performed over 8,000 carefully documented NLP and machine learning experiments, developed new architectures and algorithms, and we ultimately won um, and beat the best human at the game. And in fact, this shows the evolution of the system. Um, once we had that architecture in place, we made a very big leap, uh, a couple of more big leaps, and then it got more and more incremental. But you'll see the performance of the final system, the shape of the confidence curve got very, very good. And we were slicing right across the winner's cloud we went into the game with about a 75, or it was between you know 70 and 75 chance of winning. Uh, so you know, being in the audience during the live game was nail biting. Uh, it it looked, um, if you watch the game, I think you can find it on YouTube. It looked a lot closer than it was. If you understood Jeopardy, you realize that the game can flip uh, very easily because of daily doubles. And um, in fact, it wasn't clinched until the last three questions, last, last maybe four or five questions, if I remember correctly. Um, so Watson Victor was a landmark in AI, it reimagined the art of the possible, uh, hundreds of projects, patents and papers, hundreds of invited keynotes, billions of impressions, and a broad AI co commercialization uh, at, at IBM. Um, there was an, a, a, the demonstration was extremely powerful. The breadth of demand was, was enormous. Uh, Watson really quickly became a brand for IBM. Um, billions were invested you know, uh, across the whole company in different way, shapes and ways in which uh, Watson sort of implemented things. And it helped drive sales for all sorts of analytics and AI and business intelligence uh, for IBM. Um, you know, when I step back and think about it, you really, from more technical reflections, we created a sophisticated NLP and factoid question answering machine. It was a great architectural foundation for using search, machine learning, and NLP to find more precise answers to questions. And it was a powerful demonstration of what was possible that sort of opened up the door for all sorts of opportunities for IBM. It was not capable, though, of building a rich understanding um, uh, understandable models of language. It, 
didn't read and build conceptual models the way humans read and build conceptual models. So there, it was really more about, you know, looking at shallow features of how words coalesce and co-occur in, in, in the bodies of, of content that was there and being able to make those predictions. And in fact, since Watson, really powerful language models like GPT-3 that really brought this notion of using statistical patterns in language to um, a very precise and powerful um, you know, science uh, with, with these in incredible language models. They're getting better every day, um, but they're still doing the same thing. They I have the feathers of a parrot there because they kind of act like super parrots. They're processing all this information and figuring out how to predict answers based on the biases of how humans happen to use words. So here's a very simple uh, story. John put the sandwich in the lunchbox. He put the lunchbox in the car. And there's a question, is the sandwich in the car? And the, and the answer that the system comes back, GPT comes back with is no. The lunchbox is in the car and the sandwich is in the lunchbox. So building a model of containment and the transitivity of containment, you'd be able to infer that in fact, the sandwich is in the car uh, as well. Um, the boy approached the turtle, the turtle pulled itself into its shell. That's all you know. Why was the turtle afraid? Because the boy was carrying a large, sharp knife. And very inventive, um, but really not directly in the data. Um, so we're splicing words together that fit grammatically and fit contextually, but what is true and what isn't true, what is sensible and what isn't sensible is a whole nother layer of understanding uh, that's, that's required. So language models, as I said, behave more like super parrots, generate statistically likely, uh, we're supposed to say word patterns, um, mimic biases in the data, of course, um, get it right or wrong without explanations for why. There's no explicit mental model, if you will, or logical model that causes the language to occur in the first place, not necessarily quit, uh, quite a good fit for partnering and interacting in rational decision-making. And in fact, it's, um, it's this that led elemental cognition to kind of try to state like a higher bar for what language AI does. So instead of sort of picking from multiple choice or making a prediction, how about I give you a story and the AI should be able to describe who and what took what action, when, where, and why, and what that caused. So imagine, you know, a student, if a student really understands what they read, they should be able to build a map of what's going on, should be able to identify all the events, build out a timeline, tell me what the causal structure is, well, who did what, why, when, and where, and what did that cause to happen next, and what motivated one thing, and what purpose did they have, and you should be able to map all that out for me, and then I'd say, you did a good job in understanding that as opposed to kind of learning um, more about how words co-occur and, 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 and making quick, quick predictions. There's a big difference in how these two types of intelligence work. And in fact, we did an experiment where we took a system that was very good at reading comprehension multiple choice tests, and we created a test based on that template of understanding, that more robust structure. And in fact, the system didn't do well as, uh, as well as the humans at all. Uh, you know, in the low 30s, and we just changed the words around and it did even worse. So there's clearly headroom and there's clearly a different way of thinking about what it means for AI to really understand what it reads. And if it did a better job at that, not even perfect, perfect how well can it do in helping us make better decisions or help us do research or, or, or discovery? How does it become our partners? So in fact, deeper language understanding that constructs a transparent rational model and can serve as a fluent intelligent thought partner, that vision is exactly what inspired the formation of elemental cognition. And I started elemental cognition um, in 2015. Um, and I based it on this idea that it should do deeper language understanding and it should try to identify what we call an event structure, you know, every act that's taken, whether it's an 
a human agent or, 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 or a molecule, I don't really care. What is it doing? Why is it doing it? What is it affecting it? When is it doing it? What, in what location or context is it doing it in? And in what manner is it doing it? And that action, how does that cause another action? If we could deeply analyze content with this very rich structure, we can do sort of much more complex things. Um, and so here is um, an example uh, of a sentence uh, in macrophages, SLRP1 has shown to promote TNF alpha through activation of the MAPK cellular pathway to regulate the inflammatory, inflammatory response. It's not, a, it's not about um, you know, anybody putting their lunch in their lunchbox, but if my natural language processing is good enough, I could start to tease out this event structure. EC created a product actually called Cora that does this at scale and then connects these structures across documents and then can logically reason over the result. This is a huge enabler for, for discovery and really starts to lay the foundation for systems that do a deeper read of content and help us and accelerate uh, our, you know, our research process, our ability to understand and consume that level of, of content. So here's an actual example. So this is a, a imagining, this is, shouldn't say imaging, it should be imagining a drug repurposing use case. What evidence is there that a kinase, namely IRAC4, can affect the symptoms of a disease like rheumatoid arthritis? In fact, we worked on this use case, not exactly this use case. Um, it was for a different disease. Uh, that you know we can't mention, but um, we got a very positive result. We found the mechanism. Uh, we found the mechanism with Corin hours, where it took an expert four weeks of researching PubMed to find the same uh, the same mechanism. So, if you kind of went off and took that event structure and used it to generate a query, like how might Iraq four affect RA? There's no single document that explained. Um, how this can happen. And um, so really you have to kind of piece, piece the different things together or across multiple pieces of documents. So you're doing a lot of research and you're reading and you're pulling out answers each step of the way, and then you're connecting them and you're doing more searches and you're reading lots of stuff and you're pulling things out and making these connections. And it could take quite some time, uh, obviously, to do. I think we've all had this experience in one form or another. Um, now imagine that you can just tell Cora, and you can, um, and you just say, you know, diseases exhibit symptoms, cytokines cause symptoms, kinase inhibition can block cytokines, and you give it some basic domain knowledge. In fact, you can give it just by saying that English, um, you could draw the graph, the simple graph, and you can label it and say like, this is, if you can, if you can go through and read all the content and instantiate this graph, you, you know, you'd find, you know, reason that you can reduce symptoms, that that kinase inhibition, whatever that kinase might be, uh, might reduce uh, symptoms of that disease, whatever that disease might be. But of course, I don't want to, I don't want a yes or no. I want you to actually find the answers in that domain model. And I want you, meaning the system, to come back with evidence for each link. So imagine now I put rheumatoid arthritis on one end of this and I put Iraq inhibition, uh, IRAC4 inhibition on the other, and the system starts working on this and actually pulling out the answers and the evidence. How is it doing that? It's doing that deep, that deep NLU on each one of these links, pulling out answers, making the connections, and doing that, doing that across the next link. So it might find the symptoms of rheumatoid arthritis are bone loss, joint pain, and so forth and so on and collect all the evidence for you there and rank uh, and sort that evidence. And then take that information and go to the next link and say what cytokines can, um, can cause those symptoms. And then what uh, kinases, in this case, if you gave it IRAC4 inhibition, they'll go out and look for that and say, okay, um, do I find evidence that it can block any of those cytokines? And now by just giving it that domain knowledge, you can consistently do this for different diseases, different kinases. We're not talking now about days or weeks of doing the research. We're talking about minutes to hours, um, even going through all, and, and verifying all the content it brings up you know, for you. 
Here's an even more complex domain model where we where it involves pathways. Um, and you know, we put this domain model into Cora and it instantiated the whole thing um, and found evidence along every single chain that included the pathways. In fact, here's some of some snippets of the content that it found um, supporting, you know, with you know, which diseases affect which cells, which cells produce the cytokines, and taking that and feeding that into the pipeline. And this is just some of the evidence to give you a flavor of what it what it what it produces. So and this is automatically found answers and supporting evidence. One of the things we also do is we look for refuting evidence to watch out for confirmation biases uh, when you do this. We also, you know, sort the recency and so do all the things that a researchers want to do to make sure they pr produce a, a, a good, thoughtful research report that supports their their hypothesis. Um, and so that's kind of the the idea is a, a, a long journey, um, but a, um, sort of an exciting and uh, one for us as we got deeper and deeper into what we really want out of AI and language and you know language AI. And in fact, EC's core is apply is cross industry. So we do it in investment management. We're also doing it in, in, in healthcare pharma and insurance and a number of other, other areas. So anyway, I talked a lot. I want to stop. I want to make sure I leave some time. So thank you very thank you very much. Greetings. That was um, really um, entertaining and impressive, and the arc uh, over uh, well over a decade is um, really incredible. Uh, you know, so as you uh, first of all, I'll ask the the um, uh, participants to put questions in the Q and A box. I'm sure there'll be some. Uh, I'm sure there'll be some good ones. So um, can you um, tell us a little bit more about what your, what's the range of knowledge sources that you used back in the, uh, in the Watson days and, 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 and what about now? Like what, what are, how so do you- for, 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 Yes, it's, it's, it's interesting. So for Watson, um, there was actually a whole sub project related to, uh, identifying data that was going to be effective, uh, not, you know, limited, limited noise, um, uh, false information and things that can help answer Jeopardy. And things like Wikipedia were of course very helpful, but we also did what we call corpus expansion where we would take seed content that we knew was good and we would use that to find other content on the web that was statistically similar. So we would take seeds that we knew were seemed to be relevant. And the only way we would know this was by testing it. Um, so we would, we would bring in lots of things and find out it was not very helpful at all. Uh, we bring out things and we and then we test it and find out was helpful, was helpful. We would do this corpus expansion where you would find statistically similar things and then grow that. We also had to limit it because the more data we had, the slower the machine would go, right? So we also had to worry about the fact that this was a self-contained system. We didn't have, we had 2,880 cores. We didn't have millions of CPUs like distributed across the world. Um, you know, Watson, you know, fit in a room of about maybe 50 feet by 50 feet, right? It wasn't, um, you know, it had 80 tons of air conditioning, right? So we, we were, we had physical constraints around that. Um, so the total amount of content I think that we ultimately brought in was in the area of about a terabyte. It wasn't in web scale. It wasn't that large. After we analyzed it, it blew up to like 10 times that. So something on the order of 10 terabytes. And that, um, that was with all our analysis on it. And then all of that was put into a main memory structure so that when we got a question, we can access that information in microseconds. So we never went to disk. So as you're out there looking for data sources, were you purchasing? We did. We did it. We did in the beginning, but the but then but using this technique of essentially finding the uh, bodies of knowledge that that were good, and then basically growing them by going and doing the statistical similarity, we call it the corpus expansion. 
was much more effective actually than going out and buying stuff yeah. uh, for that application. It, you know, EC, as we work in areas like uh, in, uh, markets, like investment, and we work in areas like, you know, healthcare and pharma, we go to sources like PubMed. We, we're not, we don't work or uh, on identifying sources. People tell us, here's the data that matters. Um, yep. And we will just ingest that. Yep. Um, and, and that, you know, goes relatively smoothly. And then it's really about how deeply we can analyze that and the power of our, our query and reasoning capability on top of that, that gets all the, you know, the results. As, as in your examples, as you were sort of hacking through these metabolic pathways um, and discovering the relationships and the arrows, could you see, or would you hope that sometime, you know, even, even an informed patient could, could start to look at their disease this so way? So I, I personally love that idea. I mean, I, you know, I, I'm a big proponent of involving, you know, patients more in, in, in their healthcare and really opening that box. In fact, I, I have, I have, I'm such, I, I have the experience of going to see my doctor and he just lets me sit down at up to date. Um, and his up-to-date subscription so it lets me go at it because I have so many questions about how things are going on. I just think there's huge opportunity to get, um, to give people powerful tools to help them do effective research because going out and using web search can be scary. Not, you know, not knowing enough about the domain and having this system kind of help you and say, look, here's a high level model of how things actually work. Let me uh, work. Let me guide you through the research. Let me um, help you watch, you know, careful about the sources, the refuting evidence. You know, we, we, you know, we go out there and look for something scary and we get these confirmation biases. So one of the really exciting things of our work more broadly is just helping people do more responsible searching for questions that really matter. It's not, not like about finding a web page, but really researching problems because more and more often people are going to web search to research deep questions. And having better tools for that, I think it would be very effective. So let's go, we're gonna go up to a, a very high level. And uh, we've got a question um, about the recent claim by a Google scientist that their model became sentient. And this is, this is uh, Blake Lemoyne um, who decided that a chatbot LADMA, the language model for dialogue applications, I think, um, so then, became sentient. Can, can yeah. you just react to that? So, 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 so VentureP published my answers to this question, and I think they published them because it's so funny, because when Watson came out, and, and, and IBM, even before we won, IBM announced that we were working on the project, and people came out and were worried that Watson was sentient, not only that it was sentient, but that we were hurting it because we were forcing it to play Jeopardy game after Jeopardy game after Jeopardy game. And that was, you know, that was a, a, you know, a terrible burden to put on a sentient, a sentient being. Um, so the short answer is no, they're not sentient. I mean, um, you know, and, and even, even if you wanted to wax philosophical about what sentience even means, I, you know, I don't think we're anywhere near there. When you understand how they work, which is essentially counting, they're looking at the way, I'm, I'm oversimplifying, of course, but they're looking how words co-occur co and they're looking at the statistical patterns of how words are used in the context of other words. I don't think that that's what we imagine sentient is. So uh, here's a question from Gargana Savova, one of our faculty. Um, the who, what, why, where understanding of language sounds like abstract meaning representations, AMRs, or universal meaning representations, UMRs. What are your thoughts on methods for these high-level abstractions? Are neural approaches um, the um, it of future AI? So we, do, so we do, in order to do deep parsing to get those structures out, we do use neural approaches. Um, and so one of the ways, and, and the New York Times article that you mentioned earlier sort of talks a lot about this, is like we view our system as a composite or a hybrid AI, meaning it's not, it's not deep learning alone. We do deep learning um, to tease out those parses. Our parser, though, is in itself even a hybrid where you could um, add uh, uh, patterns to it, but we, it is mostly a, a neural, uh, uh, mostly a neural model. And the, but then once those structures are output, we interpret them with regard to a prior explicit model 
and then we reason over the constrain them and reason over them to see if they make logical sense. So we do we use deep learning and neural models very heavily um, in, in trying to parse out the language, but then we bring it into the symbolic domain where we reason over it with respect to prior explicable models and combining those two things together is very much what our architecture is about. Nice. And now back up to 50,000 feet. Um, can you talk about what, you know, what happened with IBM Watson after you left, at least at a high level? So I, I obviously I left, so I don't know any of the details, uh, uh, you know, of what happened. Um, you know, my perspective um, on my personal perspective on this is knowing the technology is that, you know, what, what, the Watson that we built to play Jeopardy, as I mentioned, was sort of a, you know, at the time, one of the most sophisticated natural language processing, uh, you know, and search systems. We, we engineered many, many features, we, uh, generic NLP features. We went back and landed on lots of the non-Jeopardy factoid, uh, you know, open domain question answering stuff, and we blew the, the, those numbers away. So we're very proud of what that was. I think that it inspired the imagination of so many people, and very quickly IBM made it a brand um, and worked on lots of different problems, um, you know, under the brand of Watson and exactly how they did them and what worked and what didn't work or why, I really can't comment on. I, I honestly don't know. Here's a question from Tim Miller, another one of our faculty. Um, how much easier would it be today to build a Jeopardy winning system using large pre-trained language models, the BERTs, et cetera? Um, with how you did it at the time. I, my, my, I haven't done it. My gut feeling it would be a lot easier um, than, than it was at the time. Um, I, I think that, you know, some of the questions I showed you uh, um, would still provide interestingly unique uh, challenges because one of the cool things about Jeopardy and one of the cool things about human cognition is that they would... They tried to make the questions more entertaining and the way you did that was they weren't sort of these straightforward questions. So they would combine pieces of information that don't typically co-occur together. Um, and so that would tend to make those kinds of things harder or that were missing information and humans would fill them in. In fact, the final Jeopardy questions were very much like that where there was always a missing piece of information and you would figure out how to fill it in and connect it. So those are still um, a little bit more challenging. Um, some of the puzzle questions were, uh, is definitely more challenging. So the pun questions and the types of things like that. But by and large, the basic foundation for doing this was about predicting, you know, the, the, the answer given the context. And the language models there are incredibly powerful at that. So I have to assume it would be a lot easier to do. Here's one from Bill Acava, one of our faculty. Is the development of an AI that truly understands from text fundamentally an engineering and scaling problem, or are additional scientific breakthroughs necessary to get there? Great question, and I I, I wish I had a the, yeah, I wish I was I wish I had a super confident answer. Um, I don't have a super confident answer. I um I will though raise sort of what is is a um I think an interesting philosophical aspect of that question, which is or at least a thought experiment. Um how well do humans understand each other? Understanding is a pretty hard thing. And I think we fool ourselves to some degree. I think we're less good at it as we'd like to think we are. We're certainly way better than machines, but we have a huge advantage, which is we have the same wetware going on. We have a lot of the same experiences. We're building very similar models in our head, but every once in a while, you'll find out that you've talked to somebody for some time, you've explained things over and over again, and, you've, and you both speak the same natural language and you really never understood each other. And it's because your prior models were so fundamentally different. So even though the words were resonating, and you could and you could process them statistically and say, yeah, I think that all made sense to me um, because all the words lined up. The fact of the matter is, you really didn't understand each other. And this goes back to not having that common prior model. So I think ultimately, machines that understand language the way humans do have to be collaborative 
and interactive where you're constantly investing in maintaining that common, that shared understanding? Here's a good question. Um, uh, technologies. Um, can you talk a little about the similarities and differences between Watson and Deep Blue from Ben Steer? So really very, very, really very, very different. Um, you know, Deep, Deep Blue um, was, first of all, about chess, obviously, but even within the chess domain, it was largely about how do we scale a relatively brute force algorithm? There are a couple of cool things that they did from a, a chess playing perspective, but largely it was about can we look ahead enough moves to, um, to score the board? And the more moves you can look ahead, the better score you can get for the current board and, and you know, make the right next move. Uh, I think if we went and, and, and did a chess playing computer again, we do it much more like the, the way they do it now, which is really with machine learning. Uh, and you know the way the way um, you know Google brilliantly did go, uh, and and that's sort of the approach you would take to game playing now. It's just play enough games in front of the machine, let it learn the patterns, uh, and 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 predict the next move. Very, sort of very different approach. So Deep Blue is largely about how do I scale the computer to look you know to do enough look ahead uh, to beat you know to beat a human. So. Taking a similar tack, if you were to explain in layman's terms how I, your IBM Watson thinks compared to how a, a child thinks and answers a question, how would you how would you frame that? So I have to tell you a story. So um, my, my, when my daughter was in, uh, I think the sixth uh, first grade, it's the first grade, she was six years old. Uh, she had a text and it was about electricity, uh, science text. And she had a, a few paragraphs about electricity. And one of the sentences said something like, you know, electricity is generated by water flowing over turbines and generating current, something like that. And then there was a question at the end of the text and it said, you know, how's electricity produced? And so my daughter comes over to me and she says, dad, you know, there's a sentence over here that says, Electricity is created by water flowing over turbines. Created and produced kind of mean the same thing. And I could just type, and I could just write in here by water flowing over turbines, but I have no idea what any of that means. I don't really know what a turbine means. I still don't really understand what electricity is. And I really don't know how water flowing over turbine would create such a thing of electricity. I don't really understand what it is. So um, the answer is humans answer questions both ways. They answer questions by using statistical language models and they actually build rich representations. So I sat down with my daughter and I explained to her um, about you know atoms and electrons flowing over atoms and how they flow in a circuit and how electron coming in will cause another electron to bounce off. And this creates motion of the electrons. It's the motions of the electrons or the current that is actually what electricity is. And she had a different level of understanding. And she actually went to her class and she insisted on giving the presentation I gave to her to her class. And she did. And her teacher wrote back, that's the first time I actually understood electricity. So my answer to your question is, we do both things. <laughs> you know, we, we, we process things statistically, looking for patterns, and we build these rich models and do these kind of logical reasoning over those things. And, you know, machines do both things. They don't do them as well. Um, one might argue they do the statistical generation now better with some of the advanced language models coming out, you know, coming out of Google. Um, but we still have yet, we still have yet to combine those two methods and produce, you know, an even, an, a, even a, a, a roughly similar intelligence, in my opinion. Are there any take home messages for designers of school curricula? Yeah, I think there, I think there is. I, I think this goes back to kind of the temple of understanding is, you know, when you're doing reading comprehension, have people produce alternative models of what they understood, you know, draw the pictures, do the timelines, the maps, draw the causal diagrams. And I think that produces a much richer 
um, um, mental model. It, it taxes the brain in a very different way and it moves people away from kind of that, that other method of answering. I, I do want to give you caveats though. I am not a cognitive psychologist. I haven't studied this in any formal way. This is just my, my, my intuitions. That's great. Well, David, this has been a terrific hour. We've gotten to spend with you. Um, I hope you do come visit us in person as well. And um, uh, I can't thank you enough for uh, taking the time. So, and uh, thank you to the participants uh, who joined us today. I'm just going to briefly um, uh, share my screen for the wrap up here uh, and remind people of some upcoming talks that we have. Uh, Derek Rossi, co-founder of Moderna, Mahela Vanishar, who is a uh, AI expert focused on learning health systems, Nate Cooperman, who runs large global networks in uh, emergency care, uh, Karen Copenhaver, who's a uh, Linux uh, lawyer and an expert in open source, Wanda Barfield, who directs the Reproductive Health Center uh, 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 vertical at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, um, a hot topic these days, and Ray Kurzweil, inventor and futurist, Christina Farr, health tech investor at Omer's Inventure, uh, Ventures, but, but formally a very uh, prominent health reporter at CNBC, Rich Miner, inventor of Android, Alan Brandt, a history of medicine professor at Harvard, Ron Balliser, chief innovation officer at Khalid Health Systems, who's used real world data in extremely innovative ways, including informing a lot of what we know about the pandemic. And um, Robert Langer, who's one of the most, uh, uh, who I think has the most patents of any uh, um, engineer out there. So uh, come uh, join us uh, throughout the year and some of those talks are even into next year uh, and we will see you all soon. Thank you.